Now, if you've ever played a video game, you might wonder how they dynamically switch from one animation to the other. This is all done by mixing animation. Blender actually supports this type of workflow and we can utilize it to produce animations much faster. And thanks to the new Blender update, this is now easier thanks to slotted actions. And we're gonna be looking at some real world examples of how to use this function today by mixing two motion capture clips, an idle animation, and a wave animation. Now, if you stick around to the end of the video, we'll also talk a bit about retargeting animations and my recommended add-ons. So not only will we talk about how to mix animations together, we'll also talk about how to copy animations from one rig to another. We have a lot to cover, so let's dive in. Now, I'm going to be providing these clips that you can download before. Now, I recorded these with my Rococo suit, which is the partner of this video, and they also have what they call an indie creator bundle, which is geared towards independent creators being able to do full production ready motion capture at home. I'll link to that in the below. Talk a bit more about it at the end of the video. Before we dive in, let's look at Blender 4.4's new feature and how it's gonna benefit us here. Here I am in Blender 4.3 with a single animation here, and you can see all the actions associated with this animation. If I open the action editor, you can see the tweak these, I'd have to go in and work through all these individual layers. Now let's look at what it looks like in Blender 4.4. Now here's the same exact animation opened in Blender 4.4. And you can see now there's two fields. We have the slotted action field and the action slot field where everything sits. And you can see here that I've called the slotted action wave. And when I twirl this up and down, it includes all those actions underneath it. And the great thing about this update is it pretty much handles itself automatically. However, you can dive in and do some more advanced actions if you want. I'll link to a tutorial that covers that below. But let's look at how we can start mixing these animations. Now you might already be well aware and think, oh great, not another NLA editor tutorial. But wait, this tutorial is going to be different. I've noticed a lot of those tutorials out there act like all you have to do is input these clips, put them on each other and blend. But most of the time, that's not going to work. And today we're gonna to talk through a lot of the quirks and other advanced tips so that you can properly edit your animations together and create full scenes much quicker. We are in the NLA editor here, and we're gonna go ahead and take a look at all the properties here, and then we're gonna look at how to mix the animations. So here you can see I have a basic idle state. Over here on the left is the armature or the object, and then my action layers. I can name these, and I've named this one idle by double-clicking it. If I click star, it will solo just that animation. If I click lock, I won't be able to do anything. And if I click uncheck, it will just deactivate this. Now over here on our end panel, we have a lot more options and this and the mixing functions, I think are where a lot of people start running into issues. Now, before we dive into the mixing, I wanna cover the action clip properties down here because I actually think this is where a lot of confusion lies. So action clips are separate from action strips. Action strips are these little bars and strips that appear in the NLA editor for us to move action clips around. But these have zero bearing on the actual action clip. To edit the action clip, which in this case we have set to idle as selected here, we need to tab into edit mode, and then we will open that action clip where we can edit it from inside the strip. Or you can come down to the dope sheet, switch from dope sheet to action editor, and select those actions here. Honestly though, I recommend working out of the strip and tabbing into edit mode as it tends to be a bit more predictive in its behavior. Let's go through each one of these properties. Now, I think one of the most confusing aspects for people is the difference of the frame start and end on the strip and the clip. If you look here on the action strip, the frame here is essentially just determining where this rests on the timeline. And if I were to shorten this, it would just go ahead and shorten the clip as if I edited it. You can also move that clip around by pressing G, and you can also split that clip by pressing Y. Now, if we come down here to the action clip, we'll see that we can start the frame start and end. And if we move this, we see that rather than moving the clip around, it's actually just getting shorter overall. So what's happening here? Well, we're actually editing the frame range of the clip that we're referencing. So if I set this to 50, I'm telling Blender, don't start the idle animation until frame 50 of that clip. And that's why it's shortening. And you can see here that we also can shorten it there by the end. So essentially here, I'm saying only play these 25 frames of the clip. I'm gonna go ahead and undo that. Next, you can check reversed here if you want, and this will just reverse the animation, simple as it seems. But down here, we can check on animated strip time, which will look like it's disabling the animation, and in a way it is, because what it's allowing us to do is manually insert the frame speeds that we want. So if I wanted to maintain the same speed, I'd insert a keyframe at zero, I'd come down to about 108, I'd enter 108 frames, enter a new keyframe, and now I can control the animation with these keyframes and how quickly I wanna move through. 
I don't really recommend using this. Instead, if you want to change the speed, I'd recommend using the playback scale. Down here, we have the ability to sync length. Now by default, this is checked to automatically do it. You can also manually refresh it. This will just sync the length of the strip to match your clip. So for an example, if I tab into edit mode here, delete a section of those keyframes and tab back out, it will change the size of the strip to automatically match the length of the clip. Below that, we have the playback scale where we can change the length of the animation. So here I've set it to be two times as slow. You can also adjust this by pressing the S key and scaling it up. Below that is the repeat, and this is does what it says. If I set repeat to three, it will repeat three times. And the great thing about this is that we're all referencing this one singular clip. So it can repeat that infinitely. This is a lot cleaner than trying to repeat loops in the graph editor. Now beneath that, we have an action menu where we can set manual frame ranges, cyclic animations, and more. However, you're almost never going to use this. So we're just gonna ignore this and focus on the important parts. Let's look at how to mix animations. Now, if you've downloaded this project file, this should be easy to follow along. I want to add a waving animation on top of this idle. So I'm going to hit Shift A to add, and I'm going to do wave. And that's just going to add a new track, and I'm going to call this track wave. Then what we're going to do is mix these two animations together. Now here, you'll notice that the animation underneath has been completely blocked out. And that is due to these settings right here. So here you see we have hold, nothing, and forward. And that's represented by the orange bars. So if I click nothing here, you can see it moves the orange bar. So it'll play our clip underneath until it gets to the next clip, and then just start playing that from whatever frame it can. Now there's also hold, so that'll do before and after. And then there's hold forward, which is what I recommend using by default, which will hold the clip, but only forward. That way the animation underneath plays until it gets to the clip on the top there. Now here's where I see most tutorials fail. What they do is they just tell you to use the blend in and out. This essentially just works as a transition. So if I click this on here, you'll see that it blends from one animation to the next, or they'll tell you to use the auto blend. The auto blend here will just automatically transition over whatever amount of overlap you have. And you can see here how it's transitioning from one animation to the next. But I think you shouldn't be using the auto blend. The auto blend gives you a lot less control. So instead, we're going to use the animated influence. So if we check on animated influence there, we can now set the influence. Currently, it's set to zero. And the advantage of this is that we can keyframe control and ease our transitions. So I'm gonna start here on frame 50. I'm going to set an influence of zero, click keyframe. And then I want this to take about 15 frames. So I'm gonna go forward to 65 and set this to one and insert another keyframe. Now, if I open my graph editor here, we can see that I have the influence here and I can now change the easing to make this smoother or sharper as I want. And automatically, just by not being linear, it tends to look a bit more natural. But there's more. There's another part of tutorials I feel like they get it wrong. They don't properly talk about all the blending modes here. So if you click here, we see replace. This does exactly what you would expect. It replaces the object underneath with the new animation. However, a lot of times when people do this, they'll start getting wonky results. And that's because you might not have keyframed all the properties the same on both animations. It's a bit confusing to see with a complicated character like this. So let's dive over and look at it on a simpler example like this cube right here. Okay, this cube has two animations. One, a location animation where it animates up and down on the location. And two, it has a rotation animation here. And on that rotation animation, all it does is rotate. So based on the last section that we just looked at, this clip should completely replace this clip. And thus the rotation should take over and we should only see the rotation animation because it's set to replace. But if I hit play, you'll see that we're getting a spinning and a location animation at the same time. And the reason being that there are no keyframes on the rotation down here. So the rotation only replaces the keyframes it has. So since the rotation has rotation keyframes, it will replace all rotation keyframes here but it doesn't have a location keyframe, so it won't replace any of those keyframes. So effectively, it's combining the two animations. So this can be very confusing because if you're working on your own characters and you animate a walk cycle, but you don't animate their head, then when you try and mix the animations, the head might bob around in a weird direction because the animation clip on top has animation on some layers that the others doesn't. So if you wanted to go ahead and change that, all you would need to do is insert a keyframe in the rotation action clip. So if you wanted to make that edit, you'd probably think that you'd want to come down to the action editor and open the rotation keyframe. And this is where things really start to get confusing in the editor. editor. This is an action clip. These are action strips. So you can see that by opening the action editor, 
I've created another action strip up here, and that's not what we want. So I'm gonna X out of here and cancel that. To edit the rotation and spot on this action strip, I can grab this strip and hit tab. You'll see here now that it's green and I can add some controls here. So I'm going to insert a single keyframe on the Z location and then press tab again. Now, when I play my animation back, you can see here that it is now no longer moving up and down on the axis. However, if I were to change it to combine there, you'll see that they will work together and combine the animations. But I said this combine has a lot of control. So let's go back to that last scene and see how we can creatively use combine to really create some powerful and unique dynamic animations. Now that we've explained that, let's look at some of these other blending modes. Now down here, you have add, subtract, and multiply. These are gonna do exactly what they say. If you add 10 scale to an object that already has two scale, you'll end up with an object that's 12 scale. Now I could show examples of all of these, but honestly, these are pretty much useless outside of motion graphics special use case scenarios. So instead, we're just gonna focus on this other one here called combine. Now you would think here that when you set combine, it would just automatically combine the idle and the wave. But as you can see here, things quickly break. And that's because in general, blending for combine isn't meant to use to combine to existing animations. Rather, it allows you to animate on top of the animations. Let me show you what I mean. Let's say that when our character waves, let's say they're looking at a crowd. So we want them to kind of look up like they're looking up at stadiums. So I'm going to start here, and what I'm going to do is come to the dope sheet, the action editor here, and I'm going to create a new action with the armature selected. I'm going to call this look up, and that's going to create a new track up here. Now what I'm going to do is with that headbone selected, I'm going to press I and insert keyframes. Then I'm going to come up here to the NLA editor, and I'm going to press this down button here. That's going to push the action down and create an action strip out of it. I'm going to switch this over here to combine, and then what I'm going to do is grab that strip there, tab into edit mode, and begin making animation adjustments. So here what I'll do is I'll come forward to frame 60 and say that I want them kind of looking up at the crowd there. And I'll just kind of add a little bit of motion like they're looking across the crowd, and then I'll duplicate this first frame. Now, if I tab back out of this mode here, we can see that we idle forward, our character looks up, they wave, and look back down. So the combined feature is incredibly powerful. Now, if all this feels way over complicated, that's because it kind of is. The NLA editor was made back in the early 2.0 series, and it needs some updates to match the rest of the software. Now, there is an add-on out there that makes the process easier called Animation Layers. I used it in some of my scenes in Watermelon Girl, such as this one here, where I animated the character riding in on the wave, and then I wanted to add a turn later. So all I had to do is click New Layer and put my animation on that layer. Here you can see I have that turn animation here, and I can turn that on and off or animate the influence up and down. So this was a really simple way to work if you want to avoid the kind of complex UI of the NLA editor. Okay, so now we've looked at the technique of mixing animations, but let's say that you have an animation you want to use on a completely different character. This is something that they do in the video game industry all the time. They do motion capture or they already have pre-existing animations and they will retarget it to other characters or other rigs. So let's look at how. There's two options. We have the Auto Rig Pro, which is a paid add-on, and then we have Rococo's own add-on, which is free. I'm gonna show you a brief example of both. So here you can see I have my cat character. I actually have a tutorial on how to make this character if you'd like to learn how here. I'll link that below. And I have this character rig, and then over here I have an animation I've downloaded and imported from Rococo. Now, there's some great videos out there diving into how to do retargeting in depth. In particular, I like this one right here, so I'm gonna link to that below. But the general idea is that you will grab your add-on here. I'm first going to show this in Auto Rig Pro, and you will grab your source armature, which I will grab this reference here, and then my rig armature. Now I've already built out this bone list and it did it automatically for me, but then you wanna go ahead and match your bones here. After that, I'm just going to bind these animations and make sure that everything's working here. So here, there's a little bit of oddities because my character is so much chunkier than this default character here, but you can see how I've successfully binded the animation to one. Now, if I wanted to fix some of these oddities, for example, here, the knees going through the ground, I would just use the combine feature I showed on the NLA editor earlier, and then just raise the hip bone up a bit to correct that animation. So that's how you can go about copying multiple animations to your characters stylized. Now, Rococo has a similar feature, and yet again, all you do is grab the source rig here, your targeted rig, 
you build a bone list. And what it's going to do is automatically populate all these bones and say that this bone matches that bone. And you can come in here and change these manually if you want. Then after that, you can just retarget your animation. The other cool thing about the Rococo add-on is that you can actually live stream your data from Rococo Studio into Blender. So you can record your animations directly into Blender and skip the entire retargeting process, or you can utilize it for live streams as well. It's pretty cool. I also mentioned some other animation add-ons that make the process easier. First, I wanna say the Ultimate Animators Toolkit. Now this is a paid add-on, but what it does is give you several add-ons that make cleaning up your graph editor and making adjustments in your graph editor much easier. I wish all of these features were in Blender by default, and this is probably my most used add-on. There's also the Copy Global Transform. This is incredible for space switching or fixing foot jitter. And I would show you how to use it. It's free, it's included in Blender, but Bot's already done an amazing 10 minute tutorial on it. So I'll link to that below. Let's talk a bit more about the collaborator of this video, Rokoko, who provided the suit that you see me using in these upcoming examples. And it's also used by other Blender users in the community, including Punisher and their series of animation challenges, as you see in the example here. Rokoko provided me a full set of their suit with facial motion capture, hand capture, and body capture. Now, Rokoko uses a system of magnets and inertial sensors, meaning you don't need markers or cameras, which is awesome because what this means is that anywhere with a laptop, computer, or Wi-Fi connection, you can record high quality motion capture data without the need of a multi-million dollar studio. If you're familiar with Ian Huberts and his Blender channel, he uses it in his videos to help motion capture and apply that data to some of his humanoid characters. I've actually been using this on some of my VR work for prototyping and recording my hands to be in the foreground. Rococo offers incredibly high quality studio level motion capture data at a much more affordable price than the competition. Now, if you're not interested in buying an entire motion capture setup, you can actually check out their library which has affordable options to download a ton of animations that you can use in your games, animations, visual effects, and more. If you're interested in checking out Rococo, check out their Indie Bundle, which is 40% off now and an additional 5% with the code you see below. Everything's linked in the description below.